Hello and welcome to Dry Dock episode 62. Saddle up everyone, it's the Patreon edition, so it's going to be a long one. A uh, couple of bits of channel admin. Um, one thing to note is you have, as of the date of this video going live, two weeks left for the Light Cruiser design competition in Spring Sharp. Um, we also, uh, separately, someone reminded me that whilst I announced the primary winner of the 75k subs giveaway, I didn't announce winners 2 and 3, uh, the people who are eligible for the channel label Teapot. So, uh, um, Wolfie916 and Alex Hunt, um, you are the two that I forgot to talk about last week, so again, please get in contact with me if you'd like to claim your prize. The only other bit of channel admin is based on feedback from various people uh, with regards to the dry dock. I will be very slightly changing the format of the dry dock, um, not in the Im immediate future, but at some point in the future. Um, and specifically, that is that people have requested that I place some links or information about the main sources that I use for various videos in the video descriptions themselves instead of announcing them in the dry dock where I deal with the questions. Um, so I'll start doing that um, with the next um, five minute guide etc that goes up and I'll keep announcing the sources for the videos um, in the question and answer for those video sections in the dry dock until we catch up to the, that point. Um, if I get some time, I might go back through some other videos and uh, retroactively include links or, or uh, descriptions of the sources in the descriptions when I have the time, and that might bring those two points together at the point where uh, we've reached uh, a guide where I have the sources listed in the description, then obviously I'll stop listing the sources in the dry dock, which will, fair enough, give us another minute or two time to answer questions. And finally, the winners of the three books that are being given away, um, those will be announced next week, so tune into that dry dock. With that said, let's get on to a Patreon dry dock edition, the long version. Zarkon de Grissom asks, Was the recoil of old cannons taken up by the block and tackle between the cannon and the bulkhead of the ship that I see in some photos around the internet? Or was it the wooden carriage itself, or did it just not matter because of the sheer weight of the cannon? Well, it most definitely did matter, and um, yeah, if you didn't have uh, all that block and tackle and rope assembly on the cannon, you'd end up with the cannon going backwards at a relatively high velocity and crushing everything in sight, which was a very bad thing uh, to happen. Now... The carriage could take some of the recoil, and indeed, if you look at some much older um, wooden warships, in you're talking about Spanish Armada era, quite a lot of those uh, guns had uh, just the forward axle, and the back, much like a lot of land-based cannons, was effectively just a, a sledge-type thing that sat on the ship. And in those cases, although they still did have some rope, the friction was able to deal with them, uh, the most of the recoil, and the ropes were there mostly to stop them sliding around when the ship was moving. That said, it was a very inefficient system because any level of friction that's sufficient to slow down and stop a cannon's recoil when the cannon weighs two to three tons also means that it's very difficult to manoeuvre the cannon, which was one of the major problems with uh, many of the ships in the Spanish Armada. And this kind of small four-wheel block carriage that you see on ships like HMS Victory and USS Constitution, this was actually arising in that kind of tu late Tudor period um, in the Royal Navy and in a few others because it was much easier to manoeuvre the guns around. But be being much easier to the manoeuvre the guns, it also meant the recoil had the potential to send the guns flying a lot further and a lot faster. And this is why you had all this complex block and tackle. It was designed to partially dampen the movement of the cannon, uh, the recoil backwards, and also for the amount of momentum it wasn't able to dampen, to provide a sufficiently strong um, brake line effectively, and the bulkhead of the ship would do the rest of the work in stopping the cannon in its tracks. The other part of the block and tackle system was then to allow the 
relatively small number of men on the gun to be able to haul the gun via the block and tackles pulleys forward once it had been reloaded because trying to if any of you have actually tried to push a car around even though a car is obviously on rubber tires and bearings and all that kind of fancy gubbins the average family car weighs considerably less than the average 32 pounder cannon and if you can imagine how difficult it is to move that even a regular car on level ground um and how difficult it is to stop it once you've got it moving you don't really want to have to be doing that to um something that weighs about twice as much on a pitching rolling heaving ship in the middle of a fight uh so that's the other half of what that block and tackle is for is to make it a lot easier to move the guns around once you've reloaded them and you need to run them out Miko Leitnen asks two questions. Where do hull number prefixes come from, aka BB for battleship, CV for carriers, etc.? And secondly, can you tell us anything about the combat divers of various nations in World War II? What did they do and how effective they were? So the combat diver question is kind of related to the mini subs um, episode that I did, so that's something that's probably best answered in a special of its own at some point. With regards to whole number prefixes, the ones you list like BB, CV, DD, although they've become fairly common shorthand these days, they're actually American-only classifications, um, <laughs> in all honesty. And that came out of the original American classification systems. Way back, they were either one letter or two or three letters. So you had things like B1 for the uh, first battleship operated on the system, and then ACR two seven whatever for armored cruisers later on that was revised and the idea was to start out this at least at the start was for a simple two letter code for everything so you'd have the basic type signified by the first letter uh, so, uh, b for battleship c for carrier d for destroyer f for frigate um or c for cruiser as well i guess um and then if it was just a basic type you would double the letter so that's why you get bb because it's a battleship um and uh, dd is a cruiser ff is a frigate um etc doesn't really work for carriers because they had to go for cv right from the start if there was a certain special type of that basic unit then the second letter would vary to tell you what it was so um ca for uh or cb or cv well for carriers um and so on and so on cl obviously is cruiser light um de uh, destroyer escort etc um that system worked well at the start it kind of went a little bit out of control in my opinion because then they found that there were actually additional modifiers to that clause so um let I me mean, take the reasons uh carriers and cruisers share a letter is because originally a, a um, carrier was known as an aviation cruiser um, for some reason using the French term volaire instead of aviation I guess possibly because aviation they already had um, CA for armoured cruisers which later also became the designator for heavy cruisers so they had to find something else um, but they then had to add th th a third letter onto a lot of um, classifications and then later on still um even fourth letter classifications for something so this is how you get things like ffg because it's a basic frigate but they're now appending the g for guided missiles um then you have things like cvl because it's a carrier but it's light so you have to have an, an l on the end they never used of course bbg for battleships but with guided missiles um uh, DDE escort destroyers DDG which is um, again the G for uh, if you see a G classification at the in at somewhere in a US uh, prefix it means guided missile so this is why you also have SSGN so it's, that's a submarine SS G guided missile uh, veg guided missile and N that's the fourth letter for nuclear um, SSBN similarly submarine equipped with the ballistic missiles and nuclear powered SSN submarine with nuclear power plant normally hunter killer and so on and so on and so forth down the line um, in other nations it's different so almost every other nation cat use uh, classifies their frigates or 
destroyers and carriers, etc., in a different manner. Some more similar to the US, some identical, but others quite different. Um, the Royal Navy, for example, assigns pennant numbers, and in practically all cases, that's a single letter. Um, there's virtually no two letter um, classifications in the Royal Navy's pennant number system, although they did keep changing them um, between the introduction of pennant numbers in the first place um, and what they are now. So at the moment, the various letter indicators for the Royal Navy are things like destroyers, quite obviously are D, C are cruisers, although we don't have any at the minute, F is frigate, um, and R is aircraft carrier. Again, probably because cruisers got the C earlier on, um, and A is already used for auxiliary vessels. So that's why if you had a look at the live stream where I showed some of the pictures of HMS Queen Elizabeth and HMS Prince of Wales, that's why their pennant numbers are R, followed by number, because they are aircraft carrier, then number within uh, the system of aircraft carriers that post-date the 1948 establishment of the pennant number system that they currently use. The other thing is that Royal Navy ships and other navies that share this sort of single letter pennant number system quite often will have that pennant number displayed on the ship alongside the number the number itself. So that's why you can have things like R09 or um, D24 or something like that because it's relatively easy to add a single letter, whereas the US Navy tends to just carry the number without the classification letters on its side because well um with the uh, ver sheer v variety of classifications you've got these days a it would look a bit complicated and b also if you've got something relatively limited like say the sale of a nuclear submarine trying to fit something like uh, ssbn 073 on it would probably take up a lot of paint and a lot of space jorg2 asks how do the ironclads of the minor nations of Europe stack up to the ones of countries like France and Britain? Was the technology on board these ships very different during the mid to late 19th century? Well, the answer is it varied wildly. Um, and I do mean exceptionally wildly. So you have ships like, say, uh, Konig Wilhelm um, here, which was a Prussian ironclad. And some of these ironclads, bear in mind, an awful lot of them were actually built for the other European powers by Britain and France, since they were the leaders in the ship, this kind of ship technology at the time. Um, in numbers, numerical terms, obviously they were never going to stack up to, to the two leading countries. But in technological terms, obviously to a certain degree, depending on who built them, but also on how much money people were willing to put into them, they could range from from anything from deeply inferior to to actually slightly superior to the latest British and French designs. So you are sort of not necessarily at one end of the scale because they were still fairly handy ships, but you have um, the Austro-Hungarian ironclads Drache and Salamander that they were the first Austro-Hungarian ironclads and actually laid down pretty early on in the, the start of the 1860s. But due to the economic circumstances and the fact they were built by Austria-Hungary, they were relatively small broadside ironclads. So they weren't going to match up directly with something like Warrior or Minotaur um, or uh, Koron, something like that. Conversely, uh, Koenig Wilhelm here was actually of a punching power that was superior yeah, that was sort of equal or superior to pretty much anything else in the water at the time that it was conceived uh, the other thing that tended to mitigate against some of the smaller european countries was that even if they designed something that was superior um or equal to the latest designs unless they'd actually ordered it from a commercial yard in britain or france their own native yards build times tended not all the time but tended to be quite a bit longer than the well-practiced commercial arts in Britain and France. So even if they did have something on the stocks that was better, 
quite often, given the sheer speed of technological advancement during the mid to late 19th century, if it took them five or six years to complete, then actually by the time they'd done that, it was uh, the technology had moved on so rapidly that the ship was actually now either sort of par for the course or even obsolete. You've got to bear in mind that in 1858-1859, the ultimate arbiter of power was effectively a slightly larger version of something that wouldn't have looked out of place at Trafalgar, just with a steam engine stuck in the middle of it. Ten, Just over ten years later, you'd gone from that to broadside ironclads, to centre battery ironclads, to turreted ironclads, and then you had the first mastless turret ship, HMS Devastation, which to certain degrees almost resembled uh, an early version of what we would later recognize as the familiar pre-dreadnought layout um that's a huge jump in technology uh, with multiple steps on the way in a decade um so it's no wonder in that period that some ships that had been somewhat more conservatively designed were obsolete upon launch even if they had been built in some of the larger and faster shipyards You've also got to consider what they are intended for in terms of use. So one of the things that is a legitimate... Well, when you match up something like, say, USS New Ironsides to uh, Warrior, Gloire, Defence, Hercules, uh, Curon, etc., one of the legitimate criticisms is that in an open sea fight, USS New Ironsides would struggle quite significantly, apart from anything with its sea keeping because of its relatively shallow draft. Conversely, in tight, confined coastal waters, some of the larger, deeper draft European ships might struggle, especially if it's quite close in on the coast, because their deeper drafts mean they can't operate in some of the shallower waters. Now, if you look at it from a pure lens of ironclads as the arbiters of oceanic navies and sort of blockading ships where if you want to break the blockade you have to come out and fight them you can then obviously make an argument that the british and french designs are significantly superior conversely if you're actually trying to do a close blockade of a country and attack their fortifications and attack their smaller coastal ironclads which is pretty much the job new ironsides was designed for then all of a sudden having a shallow draft is a significantly better tactical choice so for some nations the fact that they may not have an ironclad that can on paper match some of the bigger and better ones in an open ocean engagement may not be sort of a slightly artificial point especially when you're looking at places like say the scandinavian countries much beloved of their coastal defense ships um, where the objective would be never be to try and face off against somebody in the open ocean the idea would be to try and just defend your coastline and again much like with the new Ironsides, if they can operate in much shallower waters where they can stay out of range of the bigger, meaner ships and they, you are forced to engage them with lesser vessels, then they've done their job. So, yeah, ships designed very much for different roles. Stafford Magnus asks, What are your thoughts on the movies Master and Commander, Far Side of the World? Das Boot and Tor Tor Tora in terms of their historical accuracy and entertainment value. Well, luckily you avoid an angry rant from me because you managed to name three of the uh, much better <laughs> movies. I mean, obviously, in um, especially in Master and Commander's case, it's adapted from a book which goes into a lot more detail, and you've got to accept there is a limited amount you can fit into a movie, um, even a two or three hour one. <laughs> Because, well, yeah, there's only so, many, so much runtime you could expect an audience to sit through. But generally, in terms of those three, I quite like them. Um, they're all fairly entertaining for... I mean, they are historical. Um, well, in Das Boot and Tora Tora Tora's case, they are sort of historical or historical-ish um, films. So there is a certain limitation to the quote-unquote entertainment value you can get out of them. You have to be looking for a specific kind of film to enjoy uh, them completely. Master and Commander is a little bit more towards mass popular appeal, um, and to his credit, Russell Crowe doesn't quite give us the uh, 
linguistic tour of the UK that he does in uh, some other films, like, say, Robin Hood, where it's a... Uh, oh, cut, cut to a slightly different camera angle. And now he's from Staffordshire. And another camera angle. And now he's from Newcastle. And now he's from the, mid, the, low, uh, the um, Middlesex. And now he's from London. And now he appears to be a Welsh borderer. Anyway, um, slight distraction aside. Um, yeah, with, with, with these films... Their historical accuracy is pretty good, um, especially Tora Tora Tora's case, which is an infinitely better story uh, retelling of the attack on Pearl Harbor than Michael Bay's Pearl Harbor. Um, so yeah, I, I quite I quite appreciate those. Obviously, in Master and Commander, the Acheron um, is made into a French frigate, even though in the books, as you mentioned, it is actually an American frigate. Which makes an awful lot more sense when you start looking at it and you realise that basically, yeah, it's it's kind of a it's it's the notional mystical seventh frigate of the U.S. Navy. Uh, it's and definitely not something that the uh, the the French would have come up with on their own. Uh, but well, there you go. It is what it is. Um, move, movie license aside, I enjoy all three of those films. Colonel Overkill asks two questions. One, given the fact that Hesh effect shells weren't really perfected until after the age of the artillery battleship, do you think the fragmentation effect from a Hesh impact on the main belt would have more would be more effective on a target than a standard high explosive payload? And two, in a hypothetical warship designed World War Two era with twelve or more high caliber eighteen or twenty inch guns all forward facing and fixed <coughs> in training front-mounted style similar to USS Vesuvius with breach and loading taking place inside the citadel or a type of casement would this arrangement allow for an in for an effective warship design would the weight savings of no turret and barbet as well as the increase in gun caliber be worth the lack of gun training as well as possible short-range blind spots what other problems might this design incur now as for Hesh on battleships I don't think it would have been that effective to be perfectly honest you can see the uh, rough mechanism about how it works here the main reason that hesh is somewhat effective against uh tanks or at least it was um before the introduction of composite armors on a lot of tanks is similar to things where we've talked about things like afpds and and such like um in battleship shells which is simply the fact that when you attack a tank pretty much the entire interior volume of the tank is necessary vital and very small so this kind of detachment of a uh, bit of metal armor to go pinging around on the inside is pretty deadly the problem with battleships is just they're very large and the square cube law means their internal volume is massive and when you're talking about the armored portion of the ship generally speaking no one's dumb enough to keep anything really important immediately behind the armor i think the only exception you'll find to that is things like the turrets and the barbettes and the conning towers where you don't really have much of a choice because they are the wrapper to a very vital part of the ship. But when you're talking about just the main armor belt protection, um, which is, let's face it, the biggest target um, by surface area of pr protected armor on the ship that you're likely to hit, detaching a little bit of the main belt and sending it flying around inside the ship, sure, well, I mean, that's the splintering. It's... Splinters did occasionally get fairly deep into sh ships and cause a, some havoc, but in comparison to an armor-piercing shell getting through and exploding deep inside the ship in somewhere like the magazines or the engine room, it's not going to do anywhere near the same level of damage, and there's a fairly high chance that the splinter will be stopped somewhere where it's done damage to the ship but not damage to anything particularly vital. I suppose the flip side would be if you had somehow got Hess shells for the time period uh, of artillery battleships, if you were talking about a battleship that might end up engaging something that it hopelessly overmatched it, um, which might be things like, say, um, a Scharnhorst engaging a 15 or 16 inch gunship or um, an older vessel like, say, maybe some of the Italian refits going up against King George V, um, or even, to be honest, actually, say, the Congo fighting the South Dakota or something like that. Yeah, at that point, maybe having Hess shells would be 
better than AP that doesn't go through and HE that's just going to splatter ineffectually on the outside by dint of doing something. Um, but it's kind of like the argument I keep coming back to when I talk about um, hybrid aircraft carriers in that, yes, in theory, it could have a niche role. But if you ever end up having to use it, something's gone far, far more horribly wrong than just having an additional unique shell type that does a bit of damage is actually going to fix. As for a mass battery of heavy guns mounted forward like the Vesuvius, that is going to encounter a lot of problems. Um, mainly because you've talked about fixed in training, which means that you've basically got one range. You could try and change the range a bit by dialing the charge up and down in a similar manner to how Vesuvius was supposed to dial its pneumatic pressure up and down. But that's considerably more difficult to do because charges tend to come in several large bags. They don't tend to come in sort of multiple discs of charge that are fine enough for you to specifically calibrate a range. It also introduces an awful lot more um, of a problem uh, in terms of the work that has to be done in the guns to get them loaded um, and and aimed correctly. And apart from anything else, to be perfectly honest... Um, even if you sort of issued all your charges in various discs of explosive, by the time you've actually loaded, say, 12 discs to calibrate your guns for 20,000 yards range, by the time all that work is done, the range has probably dropped to 18,000 yards, and the whole exercise was pointless anyway. Um, the weight savings... It, it, because you, you basically will almost never be hitting anything. Um, and also you're now subjecting the guns completely to the pitching and rolling of the ship. So yeah, it's it's definitely not worth it. With with Vesuvius, it was small enough and the ranges were short enough that they could get away with it and they had a much more on, on tap dial of the range modifiers with the pressure systems. Um, in theory, you could make a certain argument for a limited, limited training and elevation um, heavy set of guns forward mounted but at that point what you've done is you've reinvented the monitor for shore bombardment um, in a freewheeling ship engagement you need to have your guns fully able to be elevated and trained otherwise an enemy ship's just going to run rings around you and shoot you to bits Moongara asks a four part question actually and I do need to point out um, to people that the purpose of the Petron uh, Q&A is supposed to be to get a question per month answered um so these multiple question types i don't want to shortchange other patrons so i will answer them but you're going to get individually shorter answers um so the four questions here how were ships during the age of sail put together were they put together using nails or using methods more often associated with furniture such as wood joinery and pegs etc did it change over time did any navy resort or had to or have a plan to use anything as weird as the British Blue Peacock program? That's the chicken-powered nuclear mine. Did other countries other than the US and the UK in World War II use naval units for fire support for ground troops? And I read when Yamato fired its uh, main guns, all the light bulbs on the ship would break. Does this sound reasonable or an exaggeration? Did ships usually have problems with other systems when firing their main guns? So Yamato firing its main guns, I don't think that's going to break all the light bulbs on the ship. Um, put it this way, if you've got light bulb breaking shockwaves reaching all the way down to things like the engineering levels, you probably have a lot more problems on the upper deck levels than your light bulbs breaking. Um, certainly, I can imagine firing a broadside, especially, or firing the main guns, especially if you're firing them close to the beam, would, uh, sort of fore and aft, you'd probably shatter quite a few bulbs. Um, near the top of the ship but not all of them um so it's not an exaggeration to say it probably broke stuff when it fired probably an exaggeration almost definitely an exaggeration to say it was all the light bulbs on the ship did other ships usually have problems with the systems when firing their main guns yes um especially in the latter period when you're talking about 16 inch plus weapons i sort of 15 16 inch weapons in the um post-world war one period to a certain degree, it depended on the designs. Um, the Nelson class, Nelson and Rodney, certainly had some rather entertaining times um, breaking things, flexing things, and um, smushing the eyes of eyeballs of their crew <laughs> um, 
with shock waves, uh, as I described in the Nelson class video, when they fired their main guns, you've obviously got uh, Bismarck in its opening engagement knocking out its own radar with the shock waves of its firing its guns. The French uh, Richelieu class did have a little bit of that problem as well. And of course, generally, when you're firing your main guns, nobody from any nation really wanted to have their anti-aircraft crews out there unless they were in um, turrets or enclosed mounts. So, yeah, I mean, they're really big guns. They have really big shock waves. Um, that there are always going to be some form of issue doing that, even if it's minor cosmetic damage, um, simply due to the power of the charges used. In terms of other nations using ships' guns for fire support, yeah, pretty much everybody did when they could um, in World War II. So, as pictured here, uh, you've got something like Prince Eugen. Prince Eugen definitely um, did fire support along with a number of other German ships on the in the Baltic area, trying to support first the attack and then later the defence um, in the confrontation between Germany and the USSR. Uh, so that was definitely a thing, and obviously in Norway they tried to do the same. The Italians occasionally would try, but they weren't really in much of a place to to use naval gunfire support most of the time. Um, the Japanese definitely tried it, um, again, to varying levels of success. So yeah, it, most n nations with a navy, and the Russians, obviously, sorry, yeah, the Russians, um, a lot of the Soviet naval forces that were caught in um, Stalingrad and uh, Leningrad would use their guns as best they could in support of the defense of those cities. So, yeah, basically any navy that was worth its salt at the time, where they could, would try and engage in fire support for ground troops it's just that most of them were never quite able to take it to the sheer levels and amounts that the US and the UK could in some of the more set-piece landings. In terms of weird naval weapons, or naval-based weapons, yeah, there were a lot of weird ones um, around. One of, them, one of the weirdest has to be the Panjandrum, as shown here, which it should come as no surprise to anyone that this was also a British weapon. And if that looks like a pair of gigantic 10-foot-high Catherine wheels with uh, what appears to be the main explosive component of a large sea mine attached between them, uh, that's because that's basically what it is. Yes, it's a giant, out-of-control, rocket-powered Catherine wheel that will explode when it runs out of <laughs> rocket power. Yeah, it didn't work very well. Um, hilarious to watch, not so hilarious to run away from when it decided to go anywhere but where you'd aimed it. Um, but yeah, nav navies are full of these kind of weird and wonderful weapons. And in terms of how ships in the Age of Sail were put together, it was a combination of things. Um, the timbers themselves would be shaped and cut so that they slotted together. They weren't j generally, they didn't just sort of butt onto each other. They were they were sort of generally steps or notches or things that would hold them together in that manner. Um, also the fact that ships were generally put together dry. Once they got into the water they would get wet, so the wood would swell somewhat, which would help lock the joints together even more strongly. Generally ships where they needed to be nailed together would be held together by a combination of two things. Uh, work, the first, as demonstrated in the picture above, is called a trenail or tree nail, or um, what, however else you want to pronounce it. And as the name may suggest, that's actually basically a nail made of wood, um, which has the wonderful advantage of if it's made out of the same material as the the uh, wood that it's holding together, it's all a homogeneous piece, and uh, there's no such thing as rust. Rust is a major enemy at sea, as we've seen in a saltwater environment, therefore iron nails were not particularly well favoured. Where they had to use iron nails, um, oh, sorry, not where they had to use metal nails, sorry, not iron nails, um, they would try and use copper nails, um, and that also mitigated against using iron nails, because if you had all copper and iron nails on the same part of the ship, you got galvanic action and then everything rusted away and the whole ship fell apart. Um, but copper, of course, is much less reactive uh, with water, and so that could hold a, a ship together, especially popular below the water line, where you really didn't want the swelling that a trenail might uh, incur that might split the timbers. 
So yeah, it was it was a combination of copper, a little bit of brass, and wooden nails for a large part. And then later on, once you started to run out of large shipbuilding timbers and also iron technology advanced, along with paint and such like, you would sometimes get internal iron fixings, iron strapping, iron nails, iron bolts to try and strengthen ships and hold them a bit more together. Um, but yeah, for the broadest part of Age of Sail shipbuilding, there were an awful lot more methods asso associated with the kind of carpentry of joinery pegs and um, certain sort of dovetail joints and things like that as compared to what we'd think of as more classic industrial shipbuilding. But it did change over time as technology advanced. Loose the Links asks... What were the benefits of centre battery ironclads over broadside ironclads? So the centre battery ironclad, as so wonderfully demonstrated by this uh, uh, unsurprisingly French uh, design, um, this arose in part due to the radical improvements in naval technology that so characterized the latter part of the 19th century and which are making my attempt to go the sort of from the early steam to pre-dreadnought uh, video incredibly difficult uh, that script had so many rewrites and splits Oy. anyway back to the subject and um yeah the, basically guns were winning the race versus armor armor was because it was still stuck at the uh, sort of iron stage, was becoming increasingly absurdly thick and heavy, and the guns themselves were also becoming considerably larger and heavier than they had been uh, at the start of the ironclad era, as a result of which the ships couldn't carry as many, and say they couldn't also carry the sheer weight of armour they needed over the full citadel length. So the idea of the centre battery ironclad was to concentrate the armour over as short a space as possible, which would then allow the armour to be thicker, which in theory would allow it to protect against the newer guns. The centre battery, as you can see here, was quite often located adjacent uh, abreast the engine spaces, because that meant you could protect your engine spaces and your guns at the same time uh, over the smallest possible space. The reason for the build, sort of sponson type build out, was that Within this small space, you therefore wanted to use the largest and punchiest guns possible because you only had a limited amount of space and therefore few guns, so might as well use the best you had. Um, if you use smaller guns, you were kind of missing the point, really. Um, and these build it built out sponsons meant that those guns could then have a much broader arc of fire, including potential ahead and aft fire. Um, so you made the best use of the limited numbers of guns. You had obviously this to a certain degree, not entirely, but to a certain degree predated the use of turrets in a number of sh uh, larger ship designs. So the advantage of the centre battery over the broadside ironclad was that, in theory, you had armour that protected the most vital part of your ships and might actually stand a chance against the more bigger, more nasty, more modern guns, and at the same time, you could carry a few of those bigger, nastier, more modern guns, which in theory you would hope would allow you to punch through the hull or, and armour of most of your opponents, and where you were fighting another broadside ironclad, the necessary sacrifice of armouring the rest of the ship, you'd kind of hope, well, either that your guns were better than the enemy's guns and you could still penetrate his centre battery, and if you couldn't, you'd hope that you could just riddle the rest of the ship and force them out of action that way. Um, so yeah, it was it was basically a concession to the fact that um, the armour necessary to repel the advances in gun technology was getting so absurdly large that it was impractical to fit it as an entire broadside belt. Nathan C. asks, Suppose that the last bomb never strikes USS Arizona, and thus she survives Pearl Harbor, m mostly damaged by the first bomb strikes. Would she still have an opportunity to have an important place in US naval history by fighting in the early battles of the war? Would she have been a decent warship in the World War II era after some refits along the lines of Tennessee or Pennsylvania? Well, there's a few important effects that might have actually in the battle itself. I mean, you're hypothesizing that the last bomb doesn't strike Arizona, thus she survives. I mean, the fact that she blew up probably saved her from the attention of further attacks. So, realistically speaking, if she hadn't, there's a fairly good chance she might have been attacked further. But let's say, for sake of argument, 
um, as per your question, that that's the last damage she receives. She does now have the problem that USS Vestal is happily on fire next to her, um, which could prove an issue. But, I mean, that's also a bit of an issue for other ships later on. But assuming that that doesn't spread either, and she makes it out, then she's damaged to a similar degree by the initial bomb hits uh, as her sister ship Pennsylvania, albeit she didn't have a couple of destroyers popping off like fireworks next to her, so possibly she comes out a little better than Pennsylvania. As a result, we can probably pretty much look to the career of her sister ship, which is of course Pennsylvania, um, to see roughly how she would have been used as a, ironically enough, as a relatively lightly damaged ship of all the various ships in Pearl Harbor. She's unlikely to get a full rebuild, um, very unlikely. In fact, she would have probably had a partial refit along the similar lines of Pennsylvania, a bit more anti-aircraft, some basic radar, etc., and then be quietly shoved into the front lines as quickly as possible. Um, so she's probably going to have a similar career, mostly uh, shore bombardments, and uh, maybe she's part of the battle line of 7th Fleet when it runs into Surigao Strait, although again, because of her only partial upgrades, so earlier model radar and fire control systems, she's probably going to be in the same boat as, again, as Pennsylvania, of not being able to locate her targets quite as easily in the darkness as the more heavily refitted standards could. So, an important place in US naval history in the early battles, probably nothing dramatic, I would imagine, um, but she probably would have had been giving fairly solid service throughout uh, the war in various shore bombardment duties, um, possibly seeing action in Europe as well. In terms of whether or not she'd be a good warship post-war, um, to be honest, the Pennsylvanias are one step up from the Nevadas. They're very much at the early half of the standard class. Um, after that, you've got the New Mexicos, you've got the Tennessees, and you've got the Colorados. They're going to be significantly better, and let's face it, none of those are retained for very long um, after the war. So, yeah, I, I don't think she'd last very long after World War Two. She'd probably be decommissioned and either made into a museum ship or scrapped in fairly short order. Kevin Kennelly asks, were fleet carrier aircraft ever, even as an expedient, rearmed dash refueled on the flight deck, or was it always done below on the hangar deck? Same question with escort carriers. So the answer to both questions is yes, you could both rearm and refuel aircraft on the flight deck, as rather lovingly demonstrated here by some Hellcats. The rearming part was more common. Um, the refueling part less so, for relatively understandable reasons, carrier designers weren't particularly keen on having dozens and dozens of high-capacity aviation fuel lines out on top of the carrier, where they could be easily breached and set on fire, but there were a few, um, obviously with a fair bit of safety precautions around them. Um, so yeah, gen generally the rearming and refueling was preferred to be done undercover in the hangar deck, um, which was also obviously, as well as being safer and more secure, it was a controlled environment, and, well, that's when, well, it wasn't where the bombs were stored, but it was where a lot more weapons could be more easily accessed, um, and because of the fact you could embed the fuel lines deeper into the structure of the ship and protect them, there were more high-capacity um, fuel lines. But where necessary, it was entirely possible um, to rearm and refuel on the flight deck, with, I say, with the rearming being a lot more um, common, uh, because, believe it or not, <laughs> explosives are actually a lot more inert and less vulnerable to combat damage and rolling around than um, fuel rubber fuel hoses full of flammable aviation fuel. Um, on escort carriers, it was actually more common, because... Uh, on fleet carriers, you have a little bit more space and bigger, high-capacity lifts, etc., um, and a lot more space inside your hangar deck. On escort carriers, none of those things really apply. You've got limited space, limited capacity, 
and limited numbers of lifts and with a short flight deck the space taken up by the use of the lifts especially on the straight deck carriers of the second world war is considerably um, less than on the fleet carrier so the turnaround on fleet on escort carriers unless it was okay job done for the day get all the aircraft or as many as possible below deck and start working out for the next day's strike if you're talking about rotating strikes and combat air patrols during the day then yes certainly they would do quite a fair a bit of rearming and refueling on deck um uh, for both types of carriers both escort and fleet um although as i say if they had the time to get the aircraft below and strike them down uh, to refuel and rearm them then they generally would because one of the things you definitely did want to do down on the hangar deck was maintenance and if you had several hours between strikes you'd try and get as many aircraft done to there as possible um, both for the safety and speed of the refueling and rearming that was a lot better down on the hangar deck and also safe just to do general maintenance overhauls etc etc Bill Cunningham asks, have you considered doing a brief rundown of the Battle of Kinburn? Well, if I wanted to be overly picky, I'd ask which one, the Russo-Turkish War one or the Crimean War one. Um, but and I appreciate your point, you're probably, I'm guessing, referring to the Crimean War one. Um, in which case, yes, um, I have considered doing it, and yes, it is actually on the long list of things to do. Um, but as with many other things, it is a fair way down that list, given that uh, in your typical four-week uh, period, and occasionally five weeks, depending on the month, um, the release schedule for Wednesday videos tends to be, um, well, yeah, it tends to be, uh, at, some, at some point along the line, a historical special of my choice at the moment, Usually at least one week has a uh, re-release -re of um, human-voiced videos taking over from the old robo-voiced ones. And then I have the deep dive video and the special video that are voted on by the different tiers of patrons. So at the moment, unless it gets voted on in one of those two voting periods, the the sort of it and a lot of other subjects that I want to cover in special videos is are going to take a while to get to. Um, but, hey, that's no bad thing. That means there'll be interesting content on the channel for a good while to come. David Blanchard asks, Germany and France almost came to war over Morocco in 1905-06, and then again in 1911. One is in the pre-dreadnought era, and the other is in the post-dreadnought era. If war did happen, which era would have had the most interesting fleet engagement between the High Seas Fleet and the Marine Nationale? What would the fleets look like? Who do you think would win, and why? Now, this is actually a really genuinely interesting question. Um, that's not to say the others aren't, but this is actually, this one really got me uh, do it, re pouring over papers and books and everything to find out what the overall uh, force capacities were. So if we just if we just look at the headliners, the the, the battleships, the 1905-1906 matchup is actually quite quite the interesting one. The French have eleven pre-dreadnoughts, if you can loosely call them that, um, starting from Brennus onwards. And the Germans have 19. And you might think, oh, hang on, that, oh, the Germans obviously therefore have a huge advantage. Well, <laughs> the French ships are individually more powerful. Um, okay, fair enough. Visually and gun layout-wise, there's an awful lot to call into question. Um, but you can't deny they have a lot of guns, and their main batteries are actually say, significantly powerful, and their secondary batteries aren't too bad either. Conversely... Quite a lot of the German pre-dreadnoughts up to that point are quite small, and a number of them are actually really, really underarmed. I mean, ten of the nineteen German ships are really more effectively coastal defence units. Their main batteries are nine point four inch guns, which is actually not too far away from the from the um, armament of the secondary batteries of quite a number of the French ships. So the numbers advantage is actually nowhere near as uh, much as you might think, and they're the Germans' most effective units that they're going to have in 1905-6, the Braunschweig class, 
has only just come into service, so they're still going to be going through a bit of teething trials and green crews. So it's going to be actually a really close fight, um, if, assuming that both sides line up their entire fleets for the engagement, and of course then you've got to take into account the role of armoured cruisers, uh, protected cruisers, and destroyers, etc. And in that aspect, actually, although neither side has vast fleets of armoured cruisers, I'd actually be tempted to give the French a little bit of an advantage, believe it or not. As, again, assuming this is a full fleet engagement, the French actually have quite a number of armoured cruisers at this point. Now, granted, they're not the world's most heavily armed armoured cruisers, um, but given this is a 1905-1906, as is seen at the Battle of Tsushima, although armoured cruisers can get beat up on quite badly if the if something like a pre-dreadnought does turn its full attention on them, they can also, in packs, do serious damage to enemy pre-dreadnoughts, and in this case having the sort of 15 or 16 armoured cruisers that the French can field versus the 4 or 5 that the Germans can field, that it kind of evens up the overall numbers, if not puts them slightly in favour of the French. And as I said, with uh, 10 of the German pre-dreadnoughts really being more towards the line of large armoured cruisers than actual battleships, it's it's a very close matchup, so I think overall, although it would be a very close fight, I'd be tempted to just about edge it towards the French on account of the fact that once you throw in the armoured cruisers into the mix, given the deficiencies of some of the German pre-dreadnoughts in firepower terms, you're probably looking at uh, round about even numbers with the French having slightly more firepower on their side, all things considered. Now, if you fast forward to 1911, things get a bit more interesting. At that point, the Germans have got five more pre-dreadnoughts in service, the Deutschland class, and they've got the four Nassaus in service. And then, depending on which part of 1911 you're looking at, they managed to commission three of the four Helgolands. That's marginal, though, so I'm tempted to possibly discount them. Um, since they're, you're looking at August, September for them to just to get commissioned. Conversely, the French only pick up six more pre-dreadnoughts. And it's you see, this is the thing. If you give the German, if you don't give the Germans the three Helgolands because they commissioned mid-1911, you also can't give the French the Dantons. Um, and given that the Germans already have the Nassaus in service, Giving the fact that the Germans then are commissioning nine new battleships, four of which are dreadnoughts, and the French are only getting six more battleships, all of which are pre-dreadnoughts, that kind of tips things radically in the Germans' favour. And if we allow ships in 1911, we say, okay, the war happens at the end of 1911, beginning of 1912. Well, the Germans get three more dreadnoughts, so they now have seven dreadnoughts. The French still have zero dreadnoughts because the core bays aren't going to come into commission until the next year, well, starting in 1913. Two of them don't even come into service until 1914. But they do get, to be fair, six Dantons, which in a close range fight should be a fairly interesting matchup with uh, early dreadnoughts. But then, um, at that point, you're kind of giving them roughly. E Roughly, the fleet's roughly equal numbers of additional pre-dreadnoughts if you separate the Dantons out as semi-dreadnoughts and then you're giving the Germans uh, uh, you're giving the Germans multiple dreadnoughts and the French are getting multiple Dantons um, and the Dantons only have an advantage in, in a close range gunfight so Although the fleet numbers are a lot more interesting, and to be fair, at that point, the Germans are probably just going to cut loose the uh, the, the earlier sort of 9.4-inch pre-treads, and the French would be very well advised to do the same for some of their earlier ships. At this point, the firepower balance has shifted entirely in the Germans' favour, um, even though cutting loose the, sort of the, the, the much older ships means that the numbers advantage kind of evens out at that point. Um, but assuming we allow for the allow the Dantons and Helgolands in, uh, 
the Germans still have a considerable advantage. So 1911 combat, I'd definitely give it to the Germans. Again, this is all assuming like whole fleet um, lineup. Realist, more realistically speaking, obviously the French have a significant Mediterranean presence. So if the Germans move with most of the high seas fleet quite early on, the French basically either have to retreat from the field or engage with a significant numerical disadvantage. Unless, of course, tensions have been ratcheting up, in which case, obviously, they might meet full fleet. But yeah, so overall, I'd say give it to the French just about maybe 55, 45 or 60, 40 in 1905, 1906. But by the time you get to 1911, the naval war, at least in a sort of a full on glorious fleet action, is really it's the Germans. It's the Germans victory to throw away at that point. Coos Army 0001 asks, which of the commanders at Pearl Harbor was in a better position to minimize the damage done by the Japanese attack, Admiral Kimmel or General Short? And is there a scenario in which the Japanese attack could have been stopped using just the forces available in Hawaii at the time? Um, in terms of commanders able to minimize the damage, that one's really difficult, actually. I'd say it's six of one and a half dozen of another. In terms of if the, their forces were just on generally higher alert, bearing in mind that, in my opinion, both Admiral Kimmel and General Short were somewhat um, left out to dry by the Pearl Harbor Inquiry. Yes, there were failings, but at the same time, they really weren't fed anywhere near as much information as they could have been that might have helped. But anyway, that aside... If we're talking about Japanese aircraft show up out of nowhere over Pearl Harbor, um, which of them, by doing a bit more of readying their forces, could have done more to stop them, then it's General Short. He had by far the greater number of resources to call on, and with the American carriers out and about, also pretty much the only significant contingent of warplanes. So if the... If General Short's forces had been on greater alert, there would have been a lot more opposition, especially aerial opposition, which would have helped break up the Japanese air attacks and lessen their effectiveness, which would have given the ships more time to prepare themselves and uh, start opening fire as well. So overall, yeah, from that perspective, General Short. Conversely, the long-range reconnaissance and intelligence that was available at the time, which included initially tracking at the Japanese carrier force before they lost they lost track of it. That was Admiral Kimmel's uh, area of responsibility. So, in terms of reducing the effectiveness of the Japanese tank, period, by get by giving enough everyone enough information to get ready in the first place then Admiral Kimmel would be the one who could minimise the damage by ordering more searches to relocate and track the Japanese carrier task force, which, after they lost contact with it, which would have given them far better indications of what their intentions were and would have allowed everyone to come up to speed a lot uh, quicker and a lot better and be in a lot better shape for the actual Japanese attack. In terms of if there's a scenario in which the Japanese attack could have been stopped using just the forces available in Hawaii in December 1941, not really. Um, I suppose in theory, if if they'd had a lot more information in advance and they'd kept track of the Japanese task force, they might have realised something was up early enough such that... The carriers that were based at Pearl Harbor might not have been deployed and could have, in theory, been sent after them. But that probably would have had an overall negative effect because two carriers with the air groups they had at the time and the experience they had at the time versus the full Kiru Butai, that's a very easy way to lose your two carriers and any escorts you send out. Um... Unless you get a complete and utter surprise attack, obviously, which eh, is possible, but I wouldn't put money on it. Um, outside of that, 
there's not really a lot you can do to stop them. And I mean, even if you do send out your carriers, if they get brushed aside, heavily damaged or sunk, then the Japanese can keep coming. Yeah, the element of surprise is lost and they'll probably take more losses, but it's not going to stop the attack. It might lessen its effectiveness, but as I said, you really want to do that at the expense of your, your two car main carriers in the region at the time? Probably not. Um, as has been mentioned in other videos, sending the battle line out to try and fight the Japanese in the deep ocean probably just means the ships end up getting sunk in the deep ocean and in our irrecoverable and a lot more people drown. So, I mean, I suppose in theory, yes, that would stop the attack on Hawaii um, because they would have achieved their objectives by sending the US fleet to the bottom in the middle of the ocean. But again, I don't think that's a great improvement. Um, and again, given the forces that were available at Hawaii, even a base on full alert, well, again, it might blunt the Japanese attack, it might reduce its effectiveness, it's not going to stop it. So no, I think once once the Japanese sailed with an intention to attack, any reasonable scenario in which the Americans realise what's going on, there's not really an awful lot they can do to stop the Japanese attacking. There's a few things they can do that would make the situation a lot worse, there's one or two things they can do to make their situation a bit better by, say, blunting the Japanese attack and reducing the amount of damage it does, but they're not going to stop it at that point. It's, it's going to happen one way or the other. Dave Collier asks, uh, Lots of navies reuse ship names, but what criteria are used for picking the name to be reused? Are any names considered too unlucky to be used again? And what a about when a ship's name is best known for something dishonourable. For example, could there be another HMS bounty? Well, the latter two questions I think I've mostly answered in last week's dry dock, so I'll refer you to those answers. Um, if you feel I didn't fully cover those bits, uh, Dave, please let me know. Um, outside of that, uh, at the beginning of the criteria used for picking the name um, when they're reusing names, Generally, it comes down to one of two things. Either that country has a particular desire to maintain a name, in which case they'll usually look for a ship of broadly similar role, if not necessarily capability, to continue the name uh, in perpetuity. And so that will be completely unrelated to what are the rest of that ship's class, if they, indeed that ship has a class that it belongs to. Um, so, for example, the Peruvian Navy has had a determination to have an Almirante Grau in uh, place as flagship for pretty much the existence of the Peruvian Navy, after the aforesaid Al uh, Admiral Grau uh, actually lived, obviously. Um, and so there's all sorts of... Uh, ships that have taken on that role and the, the choice of name has basically been well what's our biggest and best ship our flagship right well that's the Almirante Grau. There's two other primary ways that are more generally used for picking names to be reused in warships and that is either some kind of cycle or a kind of appropriate grab bag based on class so to take the two examples one by one, let's say you've got whatever is considered sort of the, the ship with the most firepower, um, the sort of the most prestigious, uh, most most explosive payload carrying vessel in the US Navy. Um, so that for a long time that was battleships. For a while, because they didn't have that many battleships, it was armored cruisers, then it was back to battleships again. Um, and nowadays it's nuclear missile submarines. So they all have state names. And picking a name to be reused, there's a little bit of political consideration and such going around. But by and large, a lot of it is just down to, okay, well, whose turn is it, roughly speaking, on the cycle of things? And the other way is uh, if a navy has decided that they're going to launch a class of ships and that class of ships is going to carry a particular theme, whether that be letters of the alphabet or some other form of uh, overall theme, then they'll look through the, their history books and sort of see, okay, well, which, 
either notable ships or notable names with hit lots of history, because there might have been on multiple ships, do we have that meet that criteria? So, actually, the Royal Navy's current and future immediate crop of submarines are good examples of that. So, with the Astute class, they've obviously gone into their sort of big book of Royal Navy ship names that begin with the letter A. And since they are nuclear attack submarines, they've sort of looked for ships that perhaps are a little bit more aggressive, warlike, and bellicose. So um, HMS Acacia, unlikely to be an Istute class submarine, but something like uh, Ambush or Agamemnon, more likely to be uh, picked, and indeed obviously have been. And similar thing for the Type 45s, the Daring class destroyers. This all name is beginning with D. Whereas the new upcoming Dreadnought class ballistic missile submarines, they've basically gone back into battleship names and they've looking at those, obviously there's no particular naming convention since you've got Dreadnought, Valiant, War Spite and King George the Sixth. So King George the Sixth is obviously following a pattern that is take that was slightly interrupted by having two King George the Fifths and all the others are taken from notable battleships in this in the particular case all World War One era battleships. Veen Vey asks, at the beginning of the US Civil War, the US Army lost many very capable officers to the CSA. How about the US Navy? Was the situation similar or was the antebellum US Navy officer corps more dominated by northerners? There were some uh, loss of Union officers in ships to the CSA at the outbreak of the American Civil War, but the split wasn't quite as much as it was with the, the land-based forces, because, well, by dint of the fact land-based forces tended to be all over the place, that meant that it was semi-proportional. Whereas with the Navy, most of the Navy was based in the sort of the central and northern states, which meant that most of the ports were in the Union, at least at the start of the war. At the start of the very start of the conflict, the Confederates only actually had one major naval port, and albeit they did obviously capture what would later become Norfolk um, early on, it wasn't originally theirs. And um, as we discussed actually in the U.S. Uh, sa sail ships video, uh, the the U the Union Navy burnt a lot of the ships there and withdrew what they could. So all, sort of that whole navy yard was also a um, primarily a Union loyalist area. So yeah, it's as I say that basically the the short version is yes, that there were some fairly capable officers in the Navy that defected or joined the Confederate Navy, but by and large, by dint of the fact that most of the ports and most of the ships were based further north in the first place the majority of the Navy transitioned over to being the Union Navy um, with relatively minimal disruption. I mean, if in terms of absolute whole numbers, there it was about a 25-75 split, with 75% of the pre-war Navy being uh, remaining in the Union and 25% going over to the Confederates. But of those... Um, if you look at ships that were actually seaworthy and could be used, the split was even more heavily favoured in, in more heavily in the Union's favour. Paul from Chicago says there's a discussion in DK Brown's The Grand Fleet and Norman Friedman's British Cruisers Two World Wars and After regarding the armour of the Arethusa class. It was made up of one inch of high tensile with a second high tensile plate on top of it. The one-inch plate seems to have provided structural strength, whereas the second did not. Why wasn't armour used for structural purposes, and how is armour strapping related to this? So the reason you don't use armour steel as structural steel in most cases, there were a few edge cases where there's always the exception that proves the rule, um, but generally it wasn't used for structural purposes because your armour is your primary damage deflection, rejection, or absorption method. 
And that means that, well, it's designed to be shot at, and if it starts taking damage, if it fails, because someone hits it too hard, or with too large a shell, or whatever, the last thing you want is to have compromised your protection, and therefore potentially already be taking damage from an exploding shell or a shot that's gone through your ship, etc., and at the same time have con com severely compromised your structural integrity. Um, because the first is potentially survivable as long as no no uh, sing no single hit hits something really critical like a magazine. But if punching a hole in a ship's armor belt also causes a massive structural weakness in the ship's um, overall strength, that could be catastrophic because that's that's when you have ships that can kind of disintegrate in one or two shots. And to give you some idea of what I'm talking about a kind of reference way back to a much earlier period. The battle at the Battle of Lepanto um, between the Ottoman Empire and the uh, sort of various collected fleets of the Western Mediterranean um, city states and national states, as well as the Pope. Um, you had cases where uh, sort of very lightly built galleys were effectively ships that were held together by a single central um, beam of some description. It could be the keel, it could be a, a, a kind of a secondary long beam, depending on the galley type. But some of the ships that were present were armed with fairly heavy cannon, and there were a number of recorded instances where a single cannonball, upon smashing this particular beam, usually the keel, but it could, could be other beams as depending, um, would just result in the entire ship coming apart in short order because its structural integrity had been completely compromised. And if you've got, say, something like the belt armor or the deck armor and you say, right, well, actually the belt and deck armor is what's holding the central portion of the ship together as well, then if that gets riddled or hit by a particularly heavy shot and fails, your ship's going to break in half, which is a very bad thing, um, obviously. So you'd rather have it so that, okay, my belt or uh, deck armor has failed, I'm damaged, but unless that has also taken out a couple of structural members and and other bits and pieces of the ship's structure, the ship itself isn't in danger of coming apart immediately, unless it's something like a destroyer that's been hit by an 18-inch high explosive shell or something along those lines. The other thing is, when it comes to battle... Uh, battle once you've taken damage when you come to repair the ship um, if the armor is let say is there to absorb and deflect damage if you are now repairing your ship in dry dock or whatever you have to remove the damaged armor now if the armor is a separate separate part of the ship to the ship's overall structure that's needed to keep hold the ship together that's fine you can unbolt the armor or uh, if it's welded on, you obviously have to um, break the welds or whatever. But you can take the armor away, the damaged parts, and you can put new armor on and the ship is otherwise unaffected. If the only thing stopping your ship from collapsing in the dry dock is the presence of its armor plate, you can't actually repair that ship. Because if you try and take the damaged plate off to replace it, your ship breaks. So... That's basically the, the the two main reasons as to why you don't use armor for structural purposes in most cases. Um, armor strapping, if I'm interpreting your definition of armor strapping the same way that I would define armor strapping, um, is more to do with helping to hold the various armor plates in, in place continuously and also to help distribute some of the force. Because um, the armor strapping that at least as far as the term that I'm familiar with, involves welding armor plates together using uh, straps of metal. So although the plates are individual units, you're sort of joining them together. You're not welding <coughs> welding them together complete um, edge to edge, but you you do have a degree of um, of join. And one of the main reasons for that is to try and have a kind of a homogenous resistance as best you can. It's not always it's not going to be quite 
ideal across the across the entire main armor belt but you want to try and have as a kind of an equal resistance across and the reason for that is similar to how if you're in a, a car or you're in a building that's on fire and you need to break a window to get out hammering on the center of the glass is actually the worst thing you can do but if you want to break the glass you need to aim for the corners and similarly uh, with armor plate if you've got a series of big rectangular um, art, uh, plate armor plates on your armor belt if a shell hits dead center then that's going to provide the maximum possible resistance if a shell hits right on the corner or right on the edge of a plate it's much more likely that that bit that's been hit will break off um, and or be penetrated under much less forceful conditions than if that shell had hit closer to the center of the plate which obviously means reduced level of protection for the ship so where you can if you've got two armor plates of roughly equal strength if you can strap them together using a, a, a welded uh, strip of metal then that you can transfer some of the force across into the other armor plate and you also by creating something of a continuous uh, piece of metal you're kind of not entirely um, but you're somewhat removing the vulnerabilities of, of the edge so if you take a hit on the uh, say on the join between two plates if they're two completely separate plates bolted to the ship there's a reasonably high chance that that shell will go through even if it wouldn't have if it had struck the center of the plate whereas if you strap them together there's a there should be a fairly decent chance assuming that the shell wouldn't have gone through elsewhere on the plate that it probably also won't go through in that location Aaron Davis asks thoughts on Beatty and Seymour switching places with Nelson uh, Beatty at the Battle of Trafalgar and Nelson at Jutland assume the magic that makes them switch translates their skills to fit the context so Nelson knows dreadnoughts as well as he knew ships of the line etc now <laughs> although fantastical as it might sound it is actually a relatively interesting scenario to think about because Nelson fighting as the admiral in charge of the British battle cruiser fleet at Jutland, assuming he's got magical knowledge about how they work, is it's a very difficult one to call, actually. On the one hand, Nelson actually knows how to... Uh, well, he knows naval signals himself, and he also has a competent uh, signals officer, because in the question, BT and Seymour have switched places, so Seymour's no longer there. So if Nelson is now in charge of HMS Lion with his signal officer, chances are that any orders he gives will actually be understood by everybody else, which means that the battlecruiser fleet probably retains the Queen Elizabeth's, um, which is going to change the outcome of the initial part of the fight dramatically if they're all entering together um obviously if he's switching at the time of the battle there's not a lot he can do about the uh flash protection having been removed but the so that's all mostly positive for the british on the other hand nelson was quite literally a sail me closer for i wish to hit them with my sword type of admiral um <laughs> and one of the key British advantages that they actually threw away during the battle cruiser fight at Jutland was superior range. Um, closing the range to where um, just the sheer numerical chance of a hit is more likely, given that the British battle cruisers obviously have the flash protection issues, is actually a net negative for the British because. Uh, with that being the case, the closer they get, A, the Germans get in range, and then B, even closer in, the German shells can penetrate their armour, and then they're more vulnerable because of the higher chance of them to explode. So it could go wrong that way if he just maintains his tactics um, the way he maintained them in the Age of Sail. On the other hand, the question does say that he knows dreadnoughts as well as he knows ships of the line. So if he knows and understands that, the one thing Nelson was generally very good at in battle was playing to his strengths. Um, so his ships could, in the edge of sail, they could fire fast, 
faster um, and they were much more self-assured in a kind of pell-mell action where you couldn't have clear orders from the Admiral once action had been joined. So that's what he adapted his tactics to suit. So if he knows the aforementioned advantages the British have, the chances are he's much more likely to try and exploit them because he was incredibly ruthless about um, exploiting any advantage he could get, perhaps a lot more so than some of the late Victorian and early 20th century admirals. So overall, and Nelson switching to the battlecruiser fleet, I think, probably does considerably better. Um, about the only problem might be that, <laughs> given given how close line came to exploding, there is every chance that Nelson might go up in a column of fire um, as the result of a random shell hit. But there you go. But yeah, over, overall, I think uh, an, a Nelson educated in 20th century tactics fighting at the Battle of Jutland in place of BT is going to do considerably better than Beatty and Seymour did historically. If Beatty and Seymour conversely switch place with Nelson and they know as much about ships of the line as, as they knew about battle cruisers, <sighs> yeah, that, that's not going to go so well. I mean, it, again, it kind of depends on when exactly they're switched in. If they're switched in right at the start of the notional battle of Trafalgar i.e. that morning the chances of the signal of all the signals and everything going somewhat wrong are relatively high on the other hand Nelson had already told everyone what his battle plan was um, and if they're substituted in as the battle is actually joined as the first shots are fired there's not a tremendous amount Seymour can do to ruin it um, because at that point, they're pretty much committed. Um, so, yes, yeah, Seymour's ability to, to wreck everything kind of varies on exactly when they're, they're ported in on that, on that morning. I don't think, ironically enough, that BT makes the situation too much worse because BT was, albeit a very flawed interpretation of the Nelsonian doctrine, he did still try and follow that Nelsonian doctrine of charge in, hit the enemy hard, and keep hitting them. So, yeah, once, well, I mean, once those two British columns are formed and heading towards the Franco-Spanish fleet, they're kind of doing what he would want them to do anyway. Um, and since the British captains in 1805 had considerably more latitude and, um, independent thought than some of the captains in 1916 the chances are that the battle of trafalgar goes roughly as hi historically did but i'd say probably in spite of bt rather than because of him i mean the slightly difficult thing about that that half of the scenario is that they are be bt and seymour are being thrown back into a battle that they know about and they know how it was won, and they know the tactics and everything, so that does give them a significantly greater advantage than Nelson coming the other way and simply being made to understand how the ships he commands operates, but no idea about how the battle actually is going to turn out. So, yeah, uh, in that vein, though, I suspect BT will probably stay undercover, Um which may have a, a somewhat of a morale effect, but there you go. So yeah, short long story short, Nelson in charge of the battle cruiser fleet. Nothing. I don't think anything massively terrible happens, and it's probably a significant improvement. BC and Seymour in charge of Trafalgar. Trafalgar probably plays out roughly as historically. Maybe a few minor issues here and there, but it's probably, as I say, in spite of them rather than because of them. Um, but with that obviously varying on exactly how far back it is before the battle itself is in get is started that they get pushed back. And the, the further back they come in, the more opportunity Seymour has to screw things up. NCC 8472 
asks who would win between a Fletcher class and a Independence class LCS, guns only. Now, this is actually, believe it or not, not quite as one-sided as you might think. Uh, most people obviously would default to, oh yes, modern guns, modern radar, blah blah blah, all this kind of stuff. However, the Fletcher class was around for quite a while, um, and to that degree, it all depends what kind of year of Fletcher you're talking about, because the most advanced system Fletchers also tended to have fewer guns. So, the ideal Fletcher for this guns-only engagement would probably be a late World War Two or up to maybe early 1950s Fletcher, with sort of the basically as long as it can keep hold of its five um five inch guns but with the best radar and fire control systems they had now if you take that kind of fletcher and you put it up against an lcs independence class variant in a gun only duel believe it or not the 57 millimeter on the lcs has about the same maximum range as the five inch 38 and realistically, the effective range is probably about the same as well. In terms of uh, ability to hit, um, outside of a few computer-aided uh, stunts and things like that, believe it or not, the overall fire control capability in terms of accuracy hasn't got that much better since World War II when it comes to naval guns. Um, it's gone a lot faster and a lot more adaptable, but the physics is just the physics of long range gunnery on moving platforms like ships means that it's not the kind of orders of magnitude level of increased accuracy that you'd get out of, say, uh, comparing a World War I ship with a World War II ship equipped with radar and proper fire control. And bear in mind, we are talking about like US Mark 37 or better fire control systems. Um, plus radar, so they're they're pretty solid. They got pretty solid accuracy levels. Rate of fire: the fifty, the single fifty-seven mil actually has it. It's got a rate of fire approximately twice the combined rate of fire of the uh, five-inch guns under realistic conditions. But it's a fifty-seven millimeter shell. Um, it doesn't contain a tremendous amount of explosive. Uh, compared to the 5 inch 38, so the actual weight of fire is less than a Fletcher. Now, the LCS obviously is faster than a Fletcher, so it can dictate the range and it can choose to duck out if it gets hit too hard, but assuming that they're both kind of lining up within their effective gun ranges and blazing away at each other at, for, at the start of the engagement, assuming they're both aware of each other at as they run in, I'd actually be tempted to just about hand this to an early 50s Fletcher class, believe it or not. Um, because I, the, as I say, the, the accuracy and rate of fire improvements that the LCS benefits from are present, but they're not, as I said before, they're not orders of magnitude better. And the weight of fire aspect of it is a makes a considerable difference um because yeah you you could hit a fletcher with uh, maybe half a dozen 57 millimeter shells and it's not going to do a tremendous amount unless you hit something vital and let's be very very clear if you're engaging at eight nine thousand yards you, despite what pop culture would have, you can forget any idea of uh, the LCS sort of being ordered, all oh, right, target the forward turret, then target the next, target the bridge. That's not how it would work at that those kind of ranges. You might be pointing the gun in that direction, but the shells are not going to be <laughs> hitting uh, that location specifically re with any great reliability, especially if the Fletcher captain is does anything other than sail in a dead straight line. Um, conversely... Uh, the LCS is many things. Well armoured and protected is not one of them. Um, if it catches a brace of 5 inch 38 calibre shells, that's going to have a much more detrimental effect on its ability to continue fighting um, than a handful of 57mm shells is going to have on a Fletcher. 
So although I wouldn't say it's a curb stomp in either direction, if we're taking the sort of optimal gun armed Fletcher, I'd be tempted to give it to the Fletcher more often than the uh, LCS in a gun only duel, as I say, assuming that the LCS doesn't just run away. Gabriel A. Hawkins asks, do you think the Japanese would have any chance of winning the Battle of Leyte Gulf if the Japanese Navy or the Japanese Army's air arm had just said no thank you to the Battle of Philippine Sea and instead concentrated all its forces in the hopes of winning a massive fleet engagement at Leyte Gulf? So instead of being a decoy, the northern force would have had teeth, more carriers, more planes, a longer period of time to have better trained pilots manning the planes while still maintaining the central and southern arms of attack. Uh, likewise, the Japanese army would have had more aircraft and more and better airfields to throw at the invasion force. Um, of course, the Japanese still have the benefit of fighting against uh, Halsey. Aside from the problem of handling, handing the Marianas to the US and placing long-range bombers in range of the Japanese mainland, do you know why the Japanese did not do this? Uh, in wargaming that I participate in, it's the obvious answer to give the Japanese Navy the best chance against the US Navy, although they still lose. So the main reason the Japanese tried to force a decisive battle at the Philippine Sea was basically they had no other choice. Um, the thing is, handing the Marianas to the US, it's not just about long-range bombers being in range of the Japanese mainland, it's also about the fact that well, long-range bombers and lesser aircraft at that point can control most of the sea lanes on the approaches to Japan, which puts an even bigger crimp in Japanese uh, ability to transport supplies and men around than the US submarines were already doing. Um, so it's not really something that you can just give away on a, pl on a platter to try and preserve your fleet, because... It's part of your inner ring of defences. Um, if you're the Japanese, it's it's not something that can you can just ignore the loss of. Um, and also, albeit that they recognised they were on the back foot, they thought they might have enough advantages by forcing a battle at that point to at least inflict a heavy defeat on the Americans. Um, obviously, in hindsight, we know that didn't work that well, but. For the sake of the question, um, with that sort of initial part being covered, if they declined that fight and preserved all their strength for Leyte Gulf, would they have done much better? Probably not. Um, all the problems that were present at Philippine Sea would have been present in a theoretical Leyte Gulf battle. I mean, by the time... By the time of the the northern force got pinned down historically, it was basically it, it was a pure decoy force. It had no real effective striking power um, in the face of the American fleet. So, uh, yes, you would have had a little bit more time for training. Yes, there would have been more aircraft. Yes, there would have been more carriers. But by and large, that probably just means more targets. I mean, it, it probably increases the chance that having fulfilled their decoy role, some of them might get away. But I don't think the carriers generally would afford the afford the Japanese that much in the way of uh, additional um, chance of victory. It just, it make it means the American assault will be slightly harder fought. But yeah, it's the the, the northern force even with the Philippine with the ships that were lost at Philippine Sea added, and as well as the aircraft that were lost, isn't really going to be up to all that much. Where it might make a difference is that with some of the other surface ships that were sunk not being sunk, if they are added to the centre force, and maybe a handful of the uh, the smaller and uh, the smaller lighter carriers and slower carriers, because bear in mind the centre force is overall fleet speed is not as great as the carrier task forces but if the Japanese decide that they're going to assign say three or four of the smaller carriers equipped with fighters as cover for the center force that might make a difference because you'd have a slightly larger surface force 
And with the fighters present, they might then be able to break up and disrupt American attacks sufficiently that Musashi isn't actually sunk. And that would, of course, mean that the historical battle of Samar may turn out to be a slightly different beast, because if the Japanese have a couple more, two, three more cruisers around, and instead of just Yamato, they have Yamato and Musashi, as well as the lesser battleships, that that might have a a fairly major impact on how the Battle of Samar goes. So if overall the Japanese had declined to fight Philippine Sea and then it had gone on to be a fight at Leyte, I say the Northern Force isn't going to change all that much, but it's possible that the Centre Force might have accomplished some of its goals. Um, which actually, ironically enough, would have been a far more decisive battle, albeit not going to really change the overall outcome of the war, um, than what the Japanese were aiming for at Philippine Sea. Memori asks, A few questions on damage control. He says, uh, I recently saw a video on the Royal Navy's uh, damage control training facility and was wondering if the damage control parties during the World Wars really used wooden wedges to plug, plug holes in the ship, or did they simply shut off the flooded bulkheads? Also for fires, aside from water hoses, I heard read that ships had foam sprays or carbon dioxide. How effective dash reliable were these systems in combat? And finally, I read that the Taiho had these fireproof curtains dividing its hangar into sections to help contain the fires. How effective do you think this system would have been if the crews were properly trained? And did the Americans or the British have a similar system? I don't recall hearing anything like that in the Franklin video. Well, on Franklin, I think the fact that everything was on fire and exploding in a relatively short amount of time probably would have negated any of system such as that that may or may not have been in place. With regards to fireproof curtains, though, they were definitely a thing that existed across multiple navies. The Royal Navy's armoured carriers definitely had those fireproof curtains um, that were deployed at various points when the ships took hits, and they did prove fairly effective. Um, it wasn't just about, to be honest, it wasn't just about... Um, shielding the rest of the hangar from fire, although obviously that was their primary purpose. The other major use that they had was in preserving some of the ship's combat capabilities after the fires, in as much as by dividing the ship's hangar up into distinct segments, it meant that when you, if you had to activate the emergency salt water fire suppression spray systems, you could activate them in that section of the hangar, and yeah, you might wreck the aircraft that are in there, um, either permanently or in need of deep repair, um, which was a historical thing that, that was an issue, but it meant all the other bits of the hangar, you, the aircraft that were in those sections, wouldn't be um, affected by that salt water spray, so you'd be able to fight on more successfully with a large remaining air group afterwards. Now, as regards the other bit, so would that have been effective on Taiho? Y yes, if they'd been deployed early enough, it might have helped stop the spread of the um, avgas fumes that contributed to the whole thing going up like a gigantic Roman candle. So, yeah, they def definitely would have helped if the crews had been able to operate them properly. Um, then what else have we got? So... Foam sprays, carbon dioxide, how effective, just reliable were they in combat? They were relatively effective. I mean, foam is, uh, for a lot of the fires that you'd experience on a carrier, a foam spray is significantly more effective than just shooting water at it, because a lot of those fires are going to involve things like burning aviation fuel and other flammable liquids, uh, which you need to smother, which foam is much better at doing than water, which to a degree can put them out, but also you can just end up with a big slick with burning petroleum products on the surface, which doesn't actually tend to help things very much. Um, so, yeah, they, they, they were pretty effective um, and reliable where where they were available. Now, 
the bulk of the question, which is obviously about uh, the actual damage control and wedging and stuff, it depended on where the leak was and what had caused it. So if you're talking about a socking great hole blown in the side of a ship by a torpedo or a battleship caliber shell hit, then no, they're not going to try and fill that with wedges apart from anything else. The sheer force of the water coming through would just probably knock you clean off your feet. So in those cases, you would try and isolate the flooding area as much as possible by closing bulkheads and, if necessary, counter-flooding. However, where you're talking about things like minor leaks caused by shock damage, if that leaks further away from a shell hit or a torpedo hit in other compartments, um, or leaks caused by near misses, splinters, etc., etc., those leaks they very definitely would try and control um with wedges and poles and coffer dams and things like that so yeah it's it, it's a proportional response where you physically can do so it's always a better idea to do so because if especially if you consider something like say a a near miss shall we say by a a heavy bomb or a large shell, or even possibly a, a, a torpedo, um, if it's successfully detonated against the ship's uh, torpedo defences. Those kind of small leaks can grow very quickly. They can obviously affect fairly vital compartments, and any water shipped on board the, the, the vessel is a detriment to its overall stability and speed. So you always want to try and stop the leak if you can. But once again, it is a matter of practicality. If it's if it's relatively small leaks as pictured, yeah, go for it. And they definitely did go for it. Um, but obviously, if there's a 20 foot by 15 foot hole in the side of the ship, I don't think they bring wooden wedges in a, a size uh, that's big enough to plug those anyway. LC214 asks, would you consider the armor and torpedo protection on the South Dakota class to be a downgrade from the North Carolina class? And why did the Montana class design revert back to the North Carolina scheme when Iowa used the same layout as South Dakota? So there's a few things there. So armor protection scheme on the South Dakotas of the Iowa's was better than that on the North Carolinas in terms of overall resistance to shells, and that's because, well, not to put too fine a point on it, but the North Carolina's armor scheme was designed to defend it against 14-inch shells. The South Dakota's armor scheme was designed to defend it against its own shells, which were the 16-inch 45 caliber gun shells. So, in terms of absolute effectiveness, South Dakota and, of course, Iowa's armor scheme um were superior in protective value to North Carolina's. As for why the Montana class reverted back to the same kind of North Carolina layout as compared to South Dakota and Iowa, that's because whilst the overall protection that the inclined internal armor belt on South Dakota and Iowa um was better than on North Carolina, the sloped internal belt itself has a number of other weaknesses which I've gone into in other videos um, primarily around flooding and reduction of internal volume uh, for a given beam so the external belt system that uh, was present on earlier US ships and then Montana would have had was a better system to have if you could afford to um, if you could afford the extra weight, uh, the, the thicker armor etc., and uh, the greater beam would impose on you. So, I mean, the South Dakota class, it had that armor protection system because it was trying to cram um, armor proof against 16-inch shells and a ship armed with 16-inch guns all into the uh, treaty limits. And I was was basically an enlargement of the design, trying to get more speed. So there wasn't much room for other changes. So yeah, absolute armor protection on 
the South Dakota scenarios is better than North Carolina's, but the overall um, efficiency and other secondary weaknesses in the layout of that armor, um, yeah, that the actual that that was an issue, which as I say the Montana was designed to address. So that's armor protection. Torpedo protection, on the other hand, the South Dakota class's torpedo protection system and then Iowa's torpedo protection system, which was a slight evolution on the South Dakotas, was designed to be superior to the North Carolinas. In practice, it turned out not to be because of, well, some of the design changes they made turned out to actually have a detrimental effect. Not quite as bad as the Yamato's uh, torpedo protection system, but they had related problems, which basically amounted to extending the armor belt down into the torpedo protection system in such a way that it created a weak point. The layout of exactly how they did that in Yamato versus South Dakota was different, and as a result, the overall weakness in Yamato's torpedo protection system was greater. However, there were weaknesses in uh, and relatively significant ones in the South Dakota's torpedo defense system, which meant that although its design was supposed to be superior, actual tests showed that it was inferior to North Carolina's, which to a degree is actually slightly worrying. I mean, fair enough, th you've got to be fair to them, they didn't know how powerful the Long Lance was, so you can't exactly expect them to design a torpedo defense system to defeat a torpedo that's actually a completely different beast to what they thought they were going to be facing. But when North Carolina was hit, the flash from the explosion actually reached the forward magazines. The fact that that was almost immediately followed by massive onrushing amounts of water meant that North Carolina didn't pull a British battlecruiser style and then I suddenly exploded trick on anybody. Um, but given that the torpedo defense system for a similar impact um, in a similar area on the South Dakotas and Iowa's would have been less well protected. It, it does raise some concerns if they had ever been torpedoed, but they weren't. So there you go. And I say Iowa's system was improved on South Dakota, so it wasn't quite, it didn't have quite the same issues. Um, it still followed the same general design principles, so the same overall flaws were there, but there were a number of changes made um, that improved its resistance and recognition of those issues was again the reason why the Montana class changed it, the layout of its torpedo defense system uh, completely uh, compared to South Dakota and Iowa. So yeah, I, overall um, I, would, I would consider that South Dakota and Iowa are probably more vulnerable to torpedo strikes than a North Carolina class, but it is relative. Um, that that's it's not to say that well the torpedo defense system was useless it may have proved useless in the event of being hit by some of the larger torpedoes that were being flung around in World War II but torpedoes come in a whole variety of shapes and sizes from relatively lightweight aerial dropped ones all the way up to the really heavyweight stuff that you see um it's say in the Imperial Japanese Navy with the Long Lance, or ironically enough, with the uh, Nelson class battleships. John Hargreaves asks, when were steam catapults developed? And he says also, I think by the Royal Navy. Prototype steam catapults showed up in the mid to late 1940s, and you are correct, they were developed at first by the Royal Navy. The Royal Navy, of course, having the slight irony of being responsible for the development of a great number of uh, aircraft carrier-related innovations uh, before, during, and after the Second World War, including the steam catapult, the angled flight deck, the uh, mirror landing system, radio uh, beacons to guide aircraft back, and a whole host of other things. And obviously sharing them with the Americans and then promptly downsizing its carrier fleet to a point that <laughs> actually the main beneficiaries of all that innovation were in fact the US Navy. Um, but there you go. Anyway, so yes, 
they the steam catapult was then first deployed on a carrier for testing and uh, in operational circumstances aboard hms perseus which if you remember the video on the colossus dash majestic class was a one of the, that class that had been finished as a repair ship and uh, so that was tested in 1950 and then uh, following successful tests it was rolled out well, not that particular steam catapult, but variants on that design were then rolled out in the mid 1950s once everything had been, when most of the bugs had been worked out in the design. And that brings us to the end of this week's Dry Dock, the Patreon edition. So thank you very much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed it, and hope to see you again in another video.